Thank you very much uh, for having me. I was saying uh, with the earlier service that your weather in August is just like our weather back home in August. So I'm feeling very at home with the rain and the drizzle and the, the cool weather. Um, your word for winter is the same as our word for summer, as it turns out. Um, so we're thinking uh, this morning about the whole issue of, of human sexuality. We, we didn't plan this, it just sort of happened that that verse we looked at as we opened the service reminded us that God puts the lonely in families. And I love that verse, and um, one of the reasons I was glad it came up was because I've I've been thinking about that verse recently, and I couldn't remember where it came from. So I was like, I know it's a psalm somewhere. So uh, now I know, and I can now look it up, which helps. I guess I could have Googled it, but easier to have someone share from it. But I love that verse because it, it assumes something about the character of life in this world, and it assumes something about what God is like, that actually God sees the loneliness of, of what life in this world can often involve, uh, he's tender to those who are lonely. And wonderfully, as God brings us to himself, he brings us to one another. Uh, as we are drawn into fellowship with him, he knits us into a community of his people. And I really want that to be the kind of backdrop to what we're thinking about this morning. Um, those who are, are lonely, those who are broken, come in all shapes and sizes. And what I want us to think about is how we can be a family to those who may come across our paths from the LGBT community, uh, which has its own fair share of brokenness and loneliness, as do we all. Um, as we think about this issue, I'm very conscious that um, for, for most of us, if not all of us, it isn't an academic issue, it isn't abstract, we're not thinking about culture as a whole, we're not so much thinking about the politics. Actually, when we think about this issue, we're thinking of people that we know and love, uh, almost all of us, I would imagine, have at least one person within our kind of close orbit who would self-identify either as LGBT or a same-sex attracted. Uh, maybe it's a member of our family or a, a colleague or a neighbor. And so when we think about this issue, we think about them. We think about people who are, are precious to us. And for, for a number of us, it's, it's even closer to home than that. Uh, certainly for myself, ever since I've had any kind of romantic or, or sexual feelings to speak of, they've been for other men and not for women. Um, I was a teenager uh, a long time ago, suffice it to say, and the world was different then. And so it actually, it took me years to figure out what was going on. Uh, I remember once when I, I think I was 14, my best friend at school started dating a girl for the first time and everyone was kind of... Uh, congratulating him and I just remember feeling really crushed inside because although I hadn't consciously thought of my friend in a romantic or a sexual kind of way I was clearly already very emotionally attached to him and so the thought that he was now being intimate with someone else left me feeling extraordinarily threatened and vulnerable and as the months began to, to kind of go on I began to realize I was developing in a different way to my friends um, I was at an all-boys high school, which meant we talked about two things and two things only. One was sport, and the other was girls. Um, I can't throw a ball if you point a gun to my head and tell me to. Uh, if it's possible for your centre of gravity to be outside of your body, I think mine is, because anything that involves balance or coordination, I end up flat on my face every time. And so I wasn't much good at talking about sport, and I wasn't much good at talking about girls, because I just didn't have the feelings for girls that my friends were describing. And so when the, the questions inevitably came of, well, who do you like and who are you pursuing? Well, I, I became a Jedi master in, in changing the subject. And when that failed, my, my last resort was I would have to make someone up. So I remember on more than one occasion, someone saying, so who do you like? Is there anyone you're, you're pursuing? And I would stand there and think, quick, think of a girl's name. Uh, Denise. Denise. Yes, I like a girl called Denise. Uh, they would then come back with, oh, do we know her? Is she from round here? And I'd have to think on my feet again and think, uh, no, no, she's not from round here. She's, um, yeah, she's from Norway, actually. So no, you won't know her or have come across her or ever verify her existence, if I'm lucky. It was a slightly tragicomic 
part of my life. I remember one day when I was 17, I was traveling back home at the end of the day from, from school and waiting for the bus. And I just remember it, it, the first time in my life, I remember thinking to myself, I think I'm gay. I think that's what this is. Again, today that would be blindingly obvious, but back, back 25 years or so ago, it wasn't on the radar in the way that it is now. But as I stood up, I remember thinking, yep, yeah, this, is, this is what's going on. I've got these feelings for guys. I don't have these feelings for girls. And as I stood there, I remember thinking that I was about to apply to university. And I remember thinking, well, this could be something I run with at university. I knew that the places I was applying to had, in those days, it was LGB societies. So I remember thinking, this, this could be something I explore at university, and no one at home would need to know. And this is, this is going to age me catastrophically, but this was just before the internet. If you can remember those dark times in, in the world when we didn't have the internet. But it meant it was entirely plausible to be one thing in one place and something else back home, and no one would know. We weren't Instagramming every waking moment of our lives, and you could get away with being a, having a double life. So I thought, well, that's, that's what I'll do. But in between standing at that bus stop and heading off to university, something else very significant happened. Um, I had a couple of friends who were, who were Christians, uh, people I really loved and, and got on well with, and a few times they had invited me to their church's youth ministry, and as many times I had declined. Um, I didn't get much time to socialize in my last couple of years at, at, at school. I had too much work to do. I wasn't going to blow a free evening on something to do with church. But after my high school exams finished, they said, do you want to come along to our youth ministry? And I thought, well, actually, I've got literally nothing else to do, so why not? <laughs> I was kind of on the fence about whether I believed in God or not. Uh, it tended to depend on whether a Christian had annoyed me or not. I sometimes became a, uh, an atheist just to wind up Christians that I knew. So I thought, oh, I'll go along, I'll see what makes my friends tick. And uh, I went to their youth ministry. Uh, to my horror, a man, I'm guessing in his 80s, stood up to give a talk. And I remember thinking, oh, come on. Give me the, the kind of corny Christian youth worker. I was, I was ready for the... <laughs> The guy in his 40s with a sideways baseball cap trying to speak in a teenage-friendly kind of way. But when this old guy started to, to speak, I was gripped. Because he said something I had never heard in my life, growing up uh, even in England. He said that the, the message of Jesus is not about God rewarding good people. It's about God forgiving bad people. And as I sat there listening to those words, I just had a sense that I was one of the people God had come to forgive. I was a pretty well-behaved teenager. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't really go off the rails. But I, I knew that I was obnoxious. Well, I was English, so that, that, that goes without saying, right? But even... Even by English standards, I was, I was obnoxious, and that's, you'll appreciate that is saying something. And I just remember feeling as though, actually, yeah, I need, I don't know my creator, and I need to come home. So I remember giving my life to Christ that summer and starting to follow him, which then obviously begs a very, very big question, because having just kind of come to terms with, with my sexuality, now, as a, a kind of new follower of Jesus, that the obvious question then is, well, what does Jesus think about sexuality? And I had no idea. I didn't even know if Jesus talked about it or not, whether it's an issue that I would need to, to think about as a Christian or not. And so over these, those kind of early months, the first couple of years of, of being a Christian, I, I began to kind of piece together what Jesus says. I really wanted to know because I, I love this man. I'm following him. I want to know what he says about this area of life. And so there are two passages I want to, to share where Jesus touches on these things. Um, obviously, Jesus is talking in a, a time and context very different to our own. So he doesn't just, there's no passage where Jesus says, hey, here's what I think about LGBT stuff. But there are places where he does speak to things that apply to this area. 
So the first is in, in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus is talking to a group called the scribes and the Pharisees. They are people who were, in one sense, they looked like kind of model Christians. They were committed to living for God. They cared deeply about kind of God's ways. And one of the things that they kind of believed was that, that sin was a bit like a virus. If you wanted to avoid sin, you needed to avoid sick people. And so they kind of thought this through and they had kind of figured out, well, if we avoid certain people and places and things that we know are sinful, we can stay kind of spiritually clean and healthy. And so they kind of spent a lot of their, their time kind of figuring out who's, who's a bit dodgy, what, what do I need to stay, stay away from? It's a bit like if, you, um, if you've got one of those weeks where you've got multiple deadlines, way too much to do, and one of your friends comes down with a virus and you think, yeah, I love you, but I'm not going anywhere near you this week. I can't afford to get sick this week, okay? I will, we will be friends again at the end of this week, but for now, I'm keeping away from you. Um, that's kind of how they thought about sin. And, and Jesus says something to them in these verses that is absolutely devastating. And I think we'll find it's challenging to us too. So that's the way they thought. Sin is out there. Let's, let's avoid it. Listen to what Jesus says. This is Matthew 15, verse 19. Jesus says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. You see, they've got it partially right. There is such a thing called sin. There is such a thing as being defiled or, or unable to kind of draw near to God. But notice where Jesus says the problem lies. They had assumed the problem is out there. Jesus says, no, no, the problem is in here. And so if you want to avoid sin... Actually, you need to avoid your own heart. You need to avoid you. And it's challenging for us because so much of our cultural narrative today is, is something along the lines of this. The way for you to flourish, the way for you to, to, to be the real you, the authentic you, is you need to look deep inside your heart and you need to discover who you really are. No one else can tell you who that is, only you can decide who you really are. And once you've discovered who you truly are, you've got to embrace that and live that out. And Jesus says to us, if you look inside your heart, you are not going to find the solution to your angst. You're going to find the cause of it. Because it's, it's from within our hearts that our, our whole sense of not being right comes. That is, that is where things have gone wrong, is in our heart. It's not just that the world out there isn't right and needs to get me in a better way than they have been. Actually, I'm not right. I'm broken. So Jesus says it, it's, it's the heart that is the source of our problems. But he also shows how he gives some of the, the symptoms of our not being right. This isn't an exhaustive list. It's just a, a sample he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery. And then he comes to, to the phrase sexual immorality, um, which actually is a, is a translation of a Greek word, porneia. I don't normally know Greek words, and, but I know that one, and it, it sounds a bit familiar to us because it's, it's actually where we get the word pornography from. Uh, the word porneia simply meant any sexual behavior outside of marriage. So porneia would have included sex before marriage, would have included adultery, as Jesus mentions separately as well, 
would have included things like prostitution. And it would have included, in Jesus' day, this would have been obvious, it would have included any kind of same-sex sexual behavior as well. And Jesus says, any of that, anything that comes under that umbrella term, again, is, is one of the, the symptoms that we're not the people God has made us to be. Now, I mentioned that it's not the only kind of thing, that there's tons of other things Jesus mentions too. False witness, slander. Anyone been on Twitter recently? But it is one of the things that Jesus mentions. And I, I bring it up because there's a, there's a myth doing the rounds today that when it came to sexual behavior, Jesus was just entirely chilled out and neutral. And a lot of people think, yeah, maybe Paul was having a kind of bad hair day one day and got a bit cranky about sex, but, but Jesus is kind of all chilled out about it. But that's not the case. Jesus actually takes the Old Testament sexual ethic and he doesn't kind of, he doesn't loosen it, he intensifies it. You read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus doesn't make things easier in this area of life. And although Jesus doesn't name homosexuality in this verse, and it wasn't in contention in first century Judaism, so there wasn't any need to name it, what he says here does address it, does include it. Well, another passage is a, a couple of chapters later in Matthew 19. Jesus again is, is talking with the Pharisees. This time, the topic of discussion is divorce. They come to Jesus in verse 3 and they say, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And they're not looking for Jesus' wisdom. They're not wanting to learn from Jesus about this area of life. We're told they're trying to trap him. Okay, they're already fed up with him. They're thinking, if we, can, if we can spring a gotcha question on him, then actually we can, we can trap him. And so they say, is it okay to divorce your wife for any reason? Big issue at the time. And they figure, however Jesus answers it, they can find some way to kind of condemn him. Well, Jesus answers with some really important things in verses 4, 5, and 6. Uh, Jesus says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus does a, a number of things there. The first thing he does is he pokes fun at them. Okay, Pharisees were, were kind of, took pride in, in how well they knew Scripture. They, they memorized swathes of the Old Testament. So to just think about this, passages that we struggle to read once as Christians, they probably knew off by heart. Okay, these guys knew their Scriptures. And yet the very first thing Jesus says to them is, have you not read? And then he quotes from Genesis 1. It's as though Jesus is saying, listen, when you did your kind of study of Scripture, did you get as far as, I don't know, Genesis chapter 1? Did you make it to page 1 of your Old Testaments? He says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? That's Genesis 1, 27. And said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's Genesis 2. So notice what Jesus is doing. They've asked him a question about divorce, and Jesus says in effect, listen, you're not going to understand divorce unless you understand marriage. But more than that, by beginning in Genesis 1, Jesus is saying in effect, you're not going to understand marriage unless you understand the fact that God has made us male and female. Jesus could have gone straight in with verse 5 and said, well, actually, you know, two people become one, and that's not designed to be undone. In one sense, that would have answered their question about divorce. But Jesus takes a step back and says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And for this reason, we have this thing called marriage. 
So as far as Jesus is concerned, this complementarity between male and female is the basis of how the Bible thinks about marriage. That complementarity forms a, a union that is unlike any other union. That is what Jesus teaches here. Not a popular thing in our own day, not an easy thing in our own day. It's worth bearing in mind that Jesus' teaching on marriage has been challenging in every single culture. When Jesus was speaking these words, it wasn't into an episode of the Waltons. Jesus was speaking these words into a context actually where his cousin had been executed for publicly holding the same sexual ethic that Jesus is teaching here. Well, Jesus begins to unpack what that one flesh union means. And in verse 10, it's, it's amazing. The disciples respond to this by saying to Jesus, well, if such is the case of a man and his wife, it's better not to marry. It's amazing, isn't it? Jesus talks about marriage and the response of the disciples is, huh, okay, right. Yeah, that sounds a bit serious. That sounds a bit like commitment. Maybe, maybe, well, maybe it's better not to marry. Maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus, that's the response. Because that all sounds a bit serious. It's funny, I've, I've preached at many weddings. I've spoken on marriage I don't know how many times. It struck me recently, no one has ever come up to me after I've taught on marriage and said, do you know what, it might be better not to marry. Which begs the question, am I teaching the same view of marriage that Jesus is? It strikes me that our, our kind of cultural default setting is marriage is easy and we need to make it as, as easy and as accessible as, as we possibly can. Singleness is far too hard. Celibacy is, is difficult. Actually, in Matthew 19, it's the other way around. Marriage is hard. If you understand marriage the way Jesus does, marriage is hard. And so when the disciples then question getting married, Jesus commends celibacy. They say it's better not to marry. Jesus doesn't say, I know, maybe live together first, you know, try before you buy. No, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus starts talking about eunuchs. Eunuchs were people who were celibate at the time of Jesus. So he's saying to the disciples, yeah, feel free. You have freedom on this issue not to marry. You can live as a eunuch. And so as far as Jesus is concerned, the, the godly alternative to marriage is to be single and celibate. And so I began to kind of put these things together as a, as a fairly young believer and thinking, okay, Jesus says sex is only for marriage. Jesus says that marriage is between a man and a woman. And he says the alternative to marriage is celibacy. Which then left me with a kind of decision point. If that is the case... I figured I had three choices. Uh, choice one is to ditch Jesus. I guess that would be the, the obvious choice for many people today. If, Jesus, if it's a choice between Jesus and fulfilling your sexuality, that's a no-brainer. And so I could have thought, well, okay, Jesus, I gave it a go. I gave it a try. It's not going to work out. Option number two was maybe I could somehow combine following Jesus with pursuing some kind of same-sex relationship. But my trouble was that I now knew enough about the teaching of Jesus to know that I couldn't do that with integrity. Uh, I spoke to a man at my church a while ago who was in a same-sex relationship and he kept saying to me I'm a strong Christian 
And I kept saying to him, no, you're not. <laughs> he said, oh, no, I've got great faith. And I said, you don't. If you don't trust Jesus with this area of life, you don't have strong faith. You can't have it both ways. Oh, I'm following Jesus whilst disagreeing with him and doing other things that he says not to do. That is not following Jesus. However we define Christian, it's got to be following Jesus, right? And so the third option is continue to follow Jesus. Guessing it's probably not a spoiler alert by this stage to, to tell you that's what I, I decided to do. But it is such... In our own culture, it is such an abnormal thing to do. I need to tell you why I chose to do that. As I said, for most people today, it would be an absurdity to pick allegiance to an ancient book and some religious leader to put that in front of kind of fulfilling your own sexual desires. But there are two reasons why I chose to do so. Uh, the first was, I knew who Jesus was. I knew who he was, and I knew what he had done for me. I became a Christian because I understood for the first time in my life what it meant for Jesus to die for me and to rise to new life for me. And I figured if, if someone has done that for me, that is someone I can trust. I remember the, the day I kind of consciously gave my life to Jesus. I remember thinking, I've got no idea what following Jesus is going to involve. Absolutely clueless. But I knew I wanted to follow him. I had no idea where he would want to lead me. But I just had a sense, I can trust this guy. This is a man I, I can give my life to. And so when it came to this kind of crunch point on, well, now I know what Jesus says about sexuality, am I still going to follow him? That for me was a no-brainer. Because I knew of, of who he was and what he had done. I thought, I want to follow him. It would be stupid not to follow him. I hope you know this, it is, such, it is such a blessing to know Jesus Christ because he knows you better than you know yourself. He loves you more than you love yourself. And he is more committed to your ultimate joy than you are. You do know that, right? So trust him. I was, um, I was in someone's office recently and they had one of these kind of little sayings framed on the wall. I don't know where it came from or who said it, but I, it struck me, so I memorised it. Um, and it said, uh, having said I've memorised it, now I can't remember it. Um, Those who hear not the music think the dancers mad. Those who hear not the music think the dancers mad. So think about that for a moment. That's true, right? So watch a music video and press mute. And it will, look, it will look ridiculous. You'll have a lot of people strutting and pouting and doing all kinds of weird things. You put the music back on and it starts... Well, it doesn't always make sense, but it makes a bit more sense, right? Those who hear not the music think the dancers are mad. Well, for us as Christians, who Jesus is and what he's done for us is the music. And therefore we follow him. We dance to his tune. And so one of the things I sometimes have to say to, to non-Christian friends of mine who just can't get why I would choose to follow Jesus in this particular area of life, one of the things I have to say to them is, you will not ultimately make sense of what I believe on sexuality unless you understand who Jesus is and what he's done. That's not me trying to kind of 
cop-out answer, you know, answer's always Jesus. You just, it should be the case for all of us. It should be the case that no one will ultimately make sense of your life other than the lordship of Jesus Christ and who he is. Your life should not be ultimately explainable or sensible unless Jesus is who he says he is. So I thought, I, you know, I, Jesus knows far more about what I should be doing with my life than I do. And so I chose to keep following him. Now, the second reason that really helped me with this was I was beginning to, to already see as a, a youngest Christian that actually Jesus treats us all the same. As I was beginning to understand what Jesus said about sex and sexuality, I was also beginning to realize that wasn't just going to challenge me, that was going to challenge anyone. One of the kind of unique, distinctive Christian insights when it comes to, to sin is that sin touches every area of life. Uh, we don't believe as Christians that everyone is as bad as they possibly could be. But what we do believe, what the Bible does teach, is that in no area of life is any of us what we should be. Sin has tainted every area of life. Therefore, it has tainted our sexuality for all of us. In other words, all of us are broken in our sexuality. That is one of the implications of, of what the Bible teaches about sin. All of us are broken in our sexuality. All of us have disordered desires in one way or another. None of us naturally lines up with how God made us to be in this area of life. So if I can put it this way, no one is straight. All of us are skewed. Okay, that's the case for all of us. Some of us are skewed in a kind of same-sex attraction kind of way. Some of us might be skewed in a, skewed in a kind of bisexual kind of way. Some of us are skewed in a, in a kind of heterosexual kind of way. But I've been a pastor for long enough. I've been a a nosy friend uh, for long enough to know that those of you who would be kind of heterosexual are, are just as broken in your sexuality. You do know that, right? All of us are broken. Therefore, that, that should make this issue safe to talk about in this church. I was speaking to a group of pastors in the UK once and about trying to reach out to the LGBT community and this, this one pastor just blurted out in the middle of a discussion, he said, how can you talk to a gay person and not be disgusted by them? I remember thinking, uh, well, maybe half a point for honesty. <laughs> um, I was kind of taken aback. I was, I was kind of a little bit speechless for a moment and I thought... My only response to him was to say this. I said, by being more disgusted by your own sin. Paul says in 1 Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He says, of whom I am the worst. Now, I don't think Paul had done a survey of the first century church and kind of discovered, oh, it turns out I actually am the worst sinner. <laughs> you know, it had to be someone, it turns out it's me. No, what Paul is saying is when you, when you know your own heart, you can't believe there's someone else out there who is more messed up and more screwed up than you. And actually, it's going to be a sign of, of health in this church when all of us are thinking, actually, you know what? I'm broken in my sexuality. I'm, I'm fallen in that area of life. Actually, it's a level playing field. The gospel treats us the same. We're all in the same boat. 
And because of that, therefore, the, the, the message of Jesus is on this area of life is going to be challenging for any of us. Because all of us are going to have to say no to certain sexual desires. None of us gets everything their way. So it's not as if Jesus says to one group of people, hey, you guys are good to go, you're absolutely fine, enjoy yourselves. But to another group of people, he's saying, oh boy, no, you're just going to have to take a few more cold showers. No, no, Jesus actually puts a constraint on all of us. I've spoken to too many married people who are not naturally wired up to be faithful to one person. And to them, the message of Jesus on sexual ethics is deeply challenging. But none of this should surprise us because actually, this is exactly what Jesus said discipleship was going to look like. So in Mark chapter 8, Jesus famously says, Mark 8 verse 34, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus says, deny yourself. Yourself needs denying. That's that's good explanation, isn't it? Deny yourself means yourself needs denying. I'm quite pleased with that. Um, <laughs> you are going to have to say a profound no to your own heart if you're going to follow Jesus. Uh, Back home, I don't know if it's the case here, people often use the language of, are you, are you affirming or non-affirming when it comes to sexuality? Do you have the same kind of... Strikes me from Mark chapter 8, Jesus is non-affirming of everyone. Because whatever your heart is, whatever your self is, whoever you truly think you are, Jesus is saying you're going to have to learn to say no to that if you're going to follow him. He goes on by saying, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Again, I love the honesty of Jesus. He's he's making it very clear before we start following him that there are going to be things he says to us that are going to be hard for us to hear. There are going to be places he wants to lead us where we don't naturally want to go. There is going to be a time in your life, if there hasn't been already, when Jesus puts his finger on something that feels sacred to you and says, I want you to give that up to me. Put it in another way, there are going to be times in your life when it feels like Jesus is killing you. When it feels like he's taking your life from you. And that the amazing paradox of the Christian life is that it's at those, actually it's at those very points that we start to live. It's as we deny ourselves that we receive life. It's as we say no to self, we become who we truly are, who God made us to be. So while the cost of discipleship is therefore high, Jesus is saying it's worth it because this is the path to life. If Jesus really does know us better than ourselves and love us more than we love ourselves and have more commitment to our ultimate joy than we have, then any word of Jesus to us is going to be an expression of that love. And I hope one of the things all of us are learning as we, as we battle through the Christian life is that actually the more I follow Jesus' ways, the more I taste his goodness, the more I see his love for me. David says the commands of the Lord are radiant. The commands of the Lord, not the promises, not the assurances, the commands of the Lord are radiant. And we say yes and amen to that because we say as well, the Lord is radiant. The commands of the Lord are radiant because the Lord is radiant. And so whilst Jesus' words are not always easy, they are always good. Is it worth it?
Of course it's worth it. If you think it isn't worth it, you're calling Jesus a liar. If you think there is anyone on this planet for whom the gospel is not good news, you're calling Jesus a liar. Um, I've run out of time, so I'm not going to tell you what Mark chapter 10 has to say on all this, but um, look up Mark chapter 10, verses 28 to 30. I have time. Brilliant. Time has been created, just like that. Amazing, isn't it? Um, Excellent. We've got another four hours here, so um, (laughs) make yourselves comfy. Um, Mark chapter 10 is a a wonderful passage. I just want to share a couple of verses uh, from Mark 10. We've just had the rich young man. He's walked away from Jesus sad because he wouldn't leave what Jesus, Jesus called him to leave. And so Peter, being Peter, then jumps in immediately and and says in verse 28, See, we have left everything and followed you. So, yeah, he he failed Discipleship 101, Jesus, but we've passed with flying colours. We're the heroes. A bit of bragging going on from Peter. Uh, This verse has become precious to me. I had um, a meeting um, several years ago. A guy turned up at church and wanted to to talk to me about Jesus, which is nice. And uh, we went out for lunch. He said, I'm interested in following Jesus, but I'm I'm gay, so I want to know what Jesus thinks about me being gay. So I tried to kind of unpack the kind of the big Bible picture that actually, and this is so important for us, that this union of a man and a woman in marriage, in the Bible, that is a picture of the union of heaven and earth in Jesus. That's why the Bible has this this particular perspective on marriage. It's a picture of Christ and the church. And I was trying to kind of unpack that to this particular guy. And he said to me, listen, my gay relationship, he'd been in a long-term partnership. He says, my relationship is the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. What could possibly be worth giving that up for? And I remember sitting there and thinking, ha, yeah, it's actually a pretty good question. And I remember saying to him, "That's, that's a really good question. Sat there for a moment more and thought, Lord, that's a really good question bit of help here would be nice (laughs) and this is the passage that God gave to me because Peter says to Jesus we've left everything and followed you and Jesus response to Peter is not well yeah and it's awful isn't it no Jesus says to Peter in verse 29 truly I say to you which is Jesus code for this bit this bit's really important this is going to be something people put on a poster one day or embroider on a cushion. It's one of those types of of sayings. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. Lots of stuff going on there, but Jesus says firstly, he's just assuming... He assumes people will leave things to follow him. That is discipleship. He assumes the most costly things to leave will be relational and familial. And there are some people in our world for whom following Jesus does mean they will have to leave family and kin behind. But Jesus' response to that reality is not to say, well, yeah, it's awful, but grit your teeth and one day you'll get heaven. No, Jesus' response is to say, even in this life, it is worth it to follow him. Because however much you leave behind, Jesus will replace. In godly kind and in far greater measure. This is is the real prosperity gospel. Jesus isn't saying, you give me a dollar, I'll give you a hundred. He's saying... When you find the gospel causes you to leave family, I will provide a hundredfold. And so Jesus says that we will receive in this life a hundredfold houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. Yep, you get a side order of persecutions thrown in too. But the point is, again, Jesus is casting the blessing in terms of family. And relationship. 
So let me tell you what that means. It means that if someone was to, to leave the gay community and join your church, Jesus says that person should be able to say, I now have more family in my life and not less as a result of coming here. I have more community in my life and not less because I'm now a follower of Jesus. I have more intimacy in my life and not less. Because in Mark 10, we are the mothers and fathers, the brothers and sisters and the children that Jesus is promising. That is you and me. And so it's, if I can put it, as, as you like bluntness, you're Australians, right? You, you can't call on people to follow the sexual ethic of Jesus if you are not providing the sense of family and community and intimacy that Jesus promises here in Mark 10. Otherwise, you are putting burdens on people's backs that they're not designed to bear. Uh, we can't call people away from illicit intimacy unless we are providing healthy intimacy because God puts the lonely in families. And we don't get a choice about whether we are the family God is putting some lonely people into. It's an unusual promise, this one of Jesus, because it, it, there's a sense in which it depends on us to fulfil it, right? But when we do, it's beautiful. And it's fruitful. Uh, when people see the quality of our relationships as a Christian fellowship, when people see the reality of the community, the depth of the intimacy, actually it affects the way they hear our message. And so God's strategy for, for winning a world on an issue as, as contentious as, as kind of LGBT stuff isn't that he's going to parachute some mega Christian into the public square who's going to out awesome everybody else. It's through the work of local churches, being church, being a kind of family that isn't available anywhere else. And so the answer to the question, is God anti-gay, is not just going to be answered in what is taught from the, from the pulpit. Actually, it's going to be profoundly answered by the way that we live together and the relationships that we have. So let me pray for you.